Let me ask you this morning, do you have trouble remembering people's names? Is it just me? I, uh, I, I have to be honest with you, I get a little anxious when somebody walks up, and I know I know them, and they just say, do you remember me? Do you, do you know me? And then you go, well, yeah, you, 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 you know, you're that, yeah, I know you, 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 that guy, you're that, yeah, I know you, We're, we go way back, you know? I actually took a memory course at Liberty University years ago that was designed to help you improve your memory. Now, this is true. God said, I'm not preaching now, I'm telling you the truth. But I took his course, and I, and I honestly could not remember the formula that you were supposed to memorize to learn how to remember names. That's how bad I am. So I can relate, and maybe you can relate to the fact that there's some things that are just hard to remember. There's some people's names that are just hard to recall. You know you know it, but you just can't quite, you can't quite get it. I, uh, I remember the story of this, uh, this guy watching this cattle, this great cow dog work, and uh, that dog went out and it gathered these cows and got them right up in the pen. It was amazing how this dog was able to work the cattle. And once it got him up into the corral, the dog goes over and actually shuts the gate with his head and then reaches up with a paw and trips the latch. And the guy said, that's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. He asked the old rancher, he goes, what's that dog's name? The rancher scratched his head and thought a minute. And he said, what's that, what's that flower that's red and has thorns and smells good? The guy says, Rose? He goes, let me ask my wife. Hey, Rose, <laughs> what's that dog's name? <laughs> I don't know if you can relate, but I certainly can. You know what so the things that we're able to remember? We're able to remember uh, the good times. We're able to remember the good people. I mean, if you have somebody that's meant a lot in your life and you've had a great experience in your life, that's easy to recall. If I were to ask you, give me the names of your best friends, you could readily, you could readily name them off. You could talk about the people who mean a lot in your life. You could uh, talk about experiences that you've had that were positive and wonderful and memorable. We, we don't tend to forget those things because they are meaningful, they are, they're pleasurable. If I were to ask you conversely, what, uh, what are the most painful experiences of life? Guess what? You could remember them as well. You could remember the most painful things you've gone through. And by the way, you could remember the most painful people you've had to put up with. Because those things are readily in our mind. They're easy to recall. They're always at the forefront of our thinking. I read a report by scientists who've actually studied this idea of memory and recall. And they say the ability to remember has nothing to do with the brain's ability to store data. Now, I'll be honest with you, I used to think that as you get older, you have more senior moments and the storage capacity starts getting full and your uh, difficulty of recall is because you have so much knowledge up here that there's just not room to store it all. Well, I was wrong. That has nothing to do with that. The mind has an incredible capacity to retain, to recall, to remember. It's, it is, according to the scientific report I read, it is what the mind processes and what the mind has determined is significant. That's what you remember. It's what the mind has processed and the mind has determined the persons who are significant. They are those in, which we, in whom we remember. So I'm saying our ability to remember and recall has a lot to do with priority. It has a lot to do with what is the preeminent, the predominant thoughts of our life and the predominant, preeminent and predominant people in our life. And I want to suggest to you on this Easter weekend what is quite obvious from my text, and that is the most significant person that we ought to remember, the most significant event we should be able to recall is what we celebrate this Easter weekend. And just for a little while that we are together, I wanna to challenge you to this idea of remembering, remembering Jesus. Now I'll tell you, there are some things that we uh, remember that we ought to forget, and there are some things that we are prone to forget that we should work on remembering. But Jesus Christ and what he did for you and me is something we should never forget. It should be at the forefront of our thinking. It should dominate our lives. It should be a priority in our hearts. I read about a man by the name of Brian Rooney. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a high school science teacher. 
And all of the kids that have taken Mr. Rooney's class have nicknamed him Mr. Monument. And the reason Brian Rooney goes by that name, Mr. Monument, is what he has dedicated himself to outside of the classroom. He has spent a small fortune in what has become his preoccupation. Brian Rooney goes around the country locating the graves of soldiers. He locates memorials to soldiers, and he catalogs the location of those memorials. At the time when he started this mission, there was not a central catalog. There was not a central place you could go to to find the locations of those who have died in service to our country. He's gone all the way back to the Revolutionary War, all the way forward to this current war in which we're in, and he's been able to locate and identify and catalog, get this, close to 9,000 memorials across the country. And he personally has visited most all of them. You say, what obsessed him to do that? What, what, what was it that drove him to do that? Well, when I dug a little deeper, what I found was that Brian Rooney served during the Vietnam War. In 1968, he was a medic at the Tet Offensive. And he treated a lot of the wounded and he saw a lot of our soldiers die. And on one occasion, a mortally wounded GI was brought to him and uh, his prognosis was, was terminal. There was no way he could be saved. And Brian was leaning over the body of this dying soldier in order to get some information off of his dog tags. And the soldier suddenly realized the presence of Rooney, opened his eyes, and whispered two words into Brian Rooney's ears that changed his life. It was the two words that would be the last two words this young soldier would ever speak on this earth. And they were simply this, remember me. Remember me. And Brian said from that day forward, I determined it would be my life's mission to remember those who have fallen in service of our country, those who have given their lives so that we would be free. And when I read that story and it touched my heart as I hope it would touch yours, I recall what the great apostle Paul said to his young protege. It was among the last words that he would ever speak before he would leave this earth. We know his words when he would say, I fought the good fight and I've kept the faith and I've finished my course. Those are great final words of the great apostle. But there's another thing that he said to young Timothy that was in that context of his final words that I wanna leave with you as our text this morning. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. And notice what the Apostle Paul said to young Timothy, remember Jesus. Don't forget him. He's the most important person in my life. He's the most important person in your life. Paul didn't suggest that he remember religion. He didn't suggest that he remembers religious orthodoxy. He didn't suggest that he remembered some religious tradition. Instead, Paul said to young Timothy, never forget Jesus. He's the most important person you could ever know. He's the most important person you could ever love. He's the most important person you could ever serve. Never forget him. He's the only one who has the power to forgive sin. He's the only one with the ability to solve your problems. He's the only one with the ability to lift the burden that you shoulder this morning. Don't forget him. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus Christ, Paul says to Timothy, raised from the dead, we serve a risen living savior, descended from David. He became one of us so that he could redeem us. And Paul said, this is my gospel. This is what I've lived for. This has been my obsession. This is the thing that has driven me. This is my passion, the gospel. What is the gospel? Paul would identify the gospel and define it for us in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I declare unto you the gospel, which is the death of Jesus Christ, his burial and resurrection according to the scripture. Paul said, that's the gospel. You know what the gospel literally means? 
It means good news. <laughs> we have good news. Now, I don't know how some pastors can take the best news in the world and make you sad for hearing it, but somehow in our profession, we've found the ability to make people feel worse after hearing what we have to say than make them feel better because they had been to church. The Bible says it's good news. Good news. It's news that can get you above your circumstance. You ever talk to anybody and they say, how are you doing? They say, pretty good, under the circumstances. I want to say, well, man, what in the world are you doing under there? <laughs> I got news for you. God can get you above your circumstance. He said we can be more than conquerors through him who loved us. He said in John 10, 10, I came to give you life, but not just life, to give you life abundantly, to give you life to the full. God is interested in you having peace in your life and you having joy in your life and you having purpose in your life. Paul said that's been the driving message of my life to communicate that to people. Timothy, don't forget it. Don't forget it. And there's three significant things I want to leave with you this morning before my part of the service is over. Number one, remember his communion. His communion. In a few moments, we'll pass the elements of communion to all of us, and we'll receive Easter communion. But I don't want you to forget the significance of communion. Communion represents the Lord's death. In fact, he says twice in this narrative where he is talking to the apostles about the significance of this. He said, when you receive the bread, the bread represents my body that was broken for you. When you receive the drink, the drink represents my blood that was shed for you. And in both instances, he says, when you receive the elements, do it, note now, remembering me. Don't forget me. You see, without the cross, you and I could not know him. We would never know Jesus if we didn't have the cross. Whenever God created all things, he placed the tree in the garden, not so that man would sin, but that so man would have a choice in the matter of sin. And God knew in the annals of time that in placing the tree in the garden, man would sin against him. And so he knew before he ever stepped from nowhere to stand on nothing and speak all of it into place, he knew he would have to have a way to redeem man. So Jesus Christ stepped forward and said, I'll be the one. The Bible says he became the lamb slain before the foundations of the world, before God created anything. He said, I know in creating everything, man will choose against me. And so in order to redeem man, I will need to send one among them who can be with them, but not be like them in the sense that he had no sin. And Jesus became God's perfect sacrifice. And without the cross, ladies and gentlemen, you and I would have no way of knowing God because there is something that we were born with that keeps us separated from God. It's called sin. It's inherent within us. It's in our DNA. It's in our nature. David put it this way in the Psalm, in sin, my mother conceived me. We were born in sin. You realize we don't have to teach our kids to lie. <laughs> we have to teach them to tell the truth because they're our kids. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I find it pretty easy to sin. I can sin effortlessly. I can sin freely. I don't have to put a whole lot of thought into sin. And most of the time when I sin, I didn't put a whole lot of thought into it. It comes natural. You know why? It's in my old nature. It's in yours too. We were born with an old nature. We were born with a burden of sin. So we needed a savior. We needed someone who could redeem us. And God who is holy cannot look upon sin. So he sent forth Jesus as his sacrifice. He who knew no sin became sin. What does that mean? That means all of the sins of the world were rolled upon Jesus on the cross so that through his sacrifice of sin, the justice of God could be atoned for. That's why John wrote in 1 John 2, 2, he said, Jesus Christ became the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. What does the word propitiation mean? It means satisfaction. It means appeasement. It's what David looked forward to in Psalm 85. When David, get this, David said in Psalm 85, verse 10, he said, mercy and truth have met together. Where did mercy and truth meet? They met at the cross. Mercy and truth, almost, it almost sounds like an oxymoron. The two of them don't get along. They don't go together. 
Truth says, he did the crime, he needs to do the time. Mercy says, well, you know, he deserves forgiveness and he deserves grace. So those two were opposing one another. But at the cross, they had a, they had a summit. At the cross, truth shows up as the prosecuting attorney to say they've sinned. When you created all things, you said you would give them the choice and they chose against you and the soul that sinned should die. That's truth. Truth says none of us deserve heaven. Truth says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's truth. And so mercy meets with truth and mercy says, I think we found a way to reconcile our differences. It was at the cross where Jesus Christ paid a penalty for our sin. And so mercy and truth, David would write prophetically, met together. And then he went on to say righteousness and truth got so excited at that meeting, they hugged one another and kissed one another. (laughs) They had a celebration at the cross because of the death of Jesus Christ. Now the justice of God can be satisfied on sin. And because of the mercy of God, we now can be connected to him. You see, think about it this way. The cross is the centerpiece of all human history. Everything before the cross looked forward to it and everything since the cross looks back on it. You say, well, Bill, how were people in the Old Testament, how did they come to faith in Christ before the cross? Well, they came to faith in Christ looking forward to the fact one day Jesus would come and die. And you and I today look back at the cross believing one day Jesus Christ did come and did die. But it's all by faith through grace. When Paul would write of the conversion of Abraham, he would write about it in Romans 4 this way. He said, what is it that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh? What did Abraham discover? Was it the keeping of the law? And there were more than just the top 10 when you think about law. There were were hundreds of laws. To the nation Israel, there were ceremonial laws. Certain clothes you couldn't wear. Certain fabrics couldn't be worn. Certain days had to be observed. Certain diets had to be honored. All of these things God gave to the nation Israel in the Old Testament so that they would be distinctive. They would be a different people. They would be uh, set apart from people who don't know God. And so people had this mindset that it must have been the keeping of the law, the restrict keeping of the law that somehow garnered the salvation of the Old Testament saints. So Paul just shoots the wheels off of that theology. He said, what is it that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, what did Abraham say? What did he find? And here it is, he answers his own question. Abraham believed God, and that belief was imputed. It's a math term. It means it was put on his account. Righteousness was put on his account uh, for, because of his faith in God. You see, all those Old Testament saints died in faith, not seeing the coming of the Messiah. Uh, Hebrews 11 said they died in faith, not receiving the promise. So they died in faith, looking forward to this event. You and I, we didn't see Jesus either. I didn't see him any more physically than Abraham or Moses. But I receive him the same way they received him. You know how? By faith. And so when we celebrate communion, we are looking at the cross. We're recognizing that was the pivotal point. That was the significant event that enabled me, who was a sinner and still is a saved sinner, it enables me to know God and have access with God. Every sin I've ever committed was covered at the cross. By the way, every sin I ever will commit is covered at the cross. Now, that doesn't mean I've got a license to thrill. (laughs) Somebody says, well, if you believe that, that means you just sin all you want to. Well, you know, if you believe that, you'll sin all you want to because God changes you want to. (laughs) And I'm just suggesting to you that all the sins that we committed were covered at the cross. And so because of the cross, I can know him. And because I can know him, it brings up my second thought, I can now love him. You don't love someone you don't know. And because of his communion, now I can remember his command. Because I know him, now I can love him. When that lawyer came to Jesus trying to trip him up, this Jewish lawyer knew all of the laws, and he said to Jesus, what's the greatest one? Of all those laws, what is the greatest one? This lawyer was so caught up in all the thou shalt nots that Jesus just blew his mind. 
He said, let me give you two thou shouts. And if you'll do these two thou shouts, you don't have to worry about the shall nots. I've told the folks before that most people get in trouble not because they're doing something they should be doing. They get in trouble because they're not doing something they should have been doing. Because if you knew what you should do and you do it, you can't do what you shouldn't do. People who do what they should do don't have to worry about doing what they shouldn't do. Because people who are doing what they shouldn't do started out by not doing what they should have done. So my focus every day is not what I should not do, but what I should do, because if I'll do what I should do, I won't do what I shouldn't do. That makes sense? Good. Here's God said, here's two things you should do. And if you do these two things, you don't have to worry about all the other things. If I were to give you an exam and I were to say to you, here's 100 questions on the exam, and you got to pass this exam to get out of the class. However, I've given you two bonus questions and you get these two right, you pass the rest. Who wouldn't take up on that deal? He said, here's the deal. You love me with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself, and you fulfill the law. You know how I can do that? Because I know Jesus. I have the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, and to know him now is to love him. And I don't do what I do because there's a law that says I do it. I do what I do because there's a greater law in me at work. I love to do it. Let me give you this illustration. Did you know there's a law in the books in the state of Texas that says if you don't feed your kids, they'll take your kids away from you? Now, you know why that law is there? It's there for stupid people. Really, that's why it's there, for the stupid people. And there's some stupid people. Got to be there. And occasionally, some of those stupid people don't take care of their kids, so they come get them. But that's not anybody I'm talking to this morning. When we break out of this holy huddle in a little while, you'll go feed those little boogers. I know you're going to do it. Some of you will trance around out there in the wet grass hunting those Easter eggs. You don't take care of your kids because there's a law in the state of Texas that says you should. Nobody in this room in a little while, when those kids say, I'm hungry, going to go, well, we got to feed them or they're going to take them away from us. <laughs> you're not going to do that. I don't, no, you're not going to do that. There's no way. Can I tell you one little funny as I thought about that? Lady asked this, the guy asked this lady whose kids were now teenagers. He said, well, if you had to do it all again, would you, would you, would you still have kids? She said, yeah, I just wouldn't have the same ones. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Here's the deal. You're going to take care of them. You're going to feed them. You're going to nurture them. Why? Not because there's a law somewhere that says you should. You're going to do it because there's a higher law at work in your life. It's called love. You know what law is? Law is the curbs on the road. You never know it's there till you swerve off the road. What's the road? Road is grace. I never know law is there. What does law do? It bumps me back out on the road. It keeps me from wrecking. It's the lines in the pool. It's the rules of the road. It's the, it's the, the game. It, it, it makes sense. It's perimeters. It's boundaries. It's things that we need. It's fences. And it's there, but you don't resist that. You understand it's there to protect you, but there's a greater law at work in you, and it's the law of love. So when I connect with God in communion, I invite him into my life. I know him, and to know him now, I can love him. And here's my third thought. And the third thought is, now that I know him and now that I love him, I can make him known. There's something in my heart that was in the heart of the great apostle that wanted everybody to know Jesus. There was something in the heart of Brian Rooney that wanted every American to know the sacrifices of our veterans that made our freedom and continues to make our freedom possible. They were worthy and are worthy of honor. And Paul said, in a greater sense, Jesus Christ is worthy of our honor. We would have no hope of heaven. We would have no hope that we'll ever see our loved ones again in heaven if it were not for Jesus. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if, it, if there be no resurrection from the dead, then all of those who have died have died without hope. But because Jesus Christ lives, we have hope. And Paul said it's the greatest news you could ever encounter. And to know that is to love that. And to love that is to want everyone else to know that. And that's the Great Commission. Tell people that don't know Jesus about Jesus. 
Tell people who are messed up. There's somebody that loves you in spite of you. So, uh, Christianity is not behavior modification. God doesn't clean you up and change you so he can love you. Are you kidding me? Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinful, Christ loved us. He loved you before you even knew he existed. He loved you before you even consciously were aware of his presence. Do you know he's been pursuing you all of your life? Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? He loves you more than you love you. You might not die for you, but he died for you. And that's what this weekend is all about. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? In just a few moments, our ushers are going to come and pass the elements of communion to you. But before you receive the elements of communion, I want to make sure you've received Jesus. You say, Bill, I've been a religious person, and I certainly get the story of Easter. I'm here in respect of all of that. But I've never, ever honestly humbled my heart and bowed my head and received Jesus into my life. I can't think of a greater weekend. I can't think of a greater day to receive Jesus than Easter. What an incredible story you could tell. Jesus Christ living in me. I want to lead you in a simple prayer, and if you've never prayed this, I challenge you to pray it. Pray this prayer with me in your heart. Lord Jesus, on this Easter Sunday morning, I acknowledge that I need you. I believe you died on that cross for me. I believe you came out of that grave and you live for me. And I need you. I've tried to fix myself. I've, I've tried to, I've tried. But I'm just tired. And on this Easter Sunday, with all that is within me, I trust you. I pray that will be the prayer of hundreds of people in these services this weekend. And Father, I pray as we receive these elements that we will receive them remembering you, remembering your death, remembering your body broken, your blood shed. We do this in remembrance of you. Our ushers are going to come now and they're going to pass the elements to you. And let me ask you, when you receive them, Hold them, if you will. I'm going to come out just behind this song, and we will receive these elements together, and then we'll go home. So may God bless you as we receive the elements, and we enjoy this song.
Remember me when the children leave their Sunday school with smiles. Remember me when they're old enough to teach, old enough to preach, old enough to leave. King who conquered the grave, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy. Thank you for being here this morning. We hope you have a very happy Easter. Come back and see us next weekend. And uh, I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>